Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed. Hi, welcome to Writers in Focus. I'm your host, James Taylor, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest one of my favorite writers, Miss Karen Slaughter. May I call you Karen? Absolutely. I'd like to welcome you to the Atlanta Fulton Public Library and the Fulton County Government Center. By way of introduction, we're going to talk about Karen's 13th novel, uh, Unseen. It's in the uh, Will Trent series. We'll talk about that later. Um, I, I say this with admiration and uh, <clears throat> some hesitation because I don't want this to go to Karen's head, but... Uh, you're one of the most successful writers I've met in, in quite a while. You have 30 million books in print, published in 32 languages around the world, including both versions of Portuguese, many versions of Chinese. You can walk down the streets of Amsterdam and, oddly enough, Auckland, New Zealand, and you're, you're, huge, in, you're huge in Australia and New Zealand, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. You started writing what I would characterize as dark crime thriller, suspense, psychological portrait novels about, what, 13, 14 years ago? Mm -hmm. Your latest novel is Unseen, and I'm going to hand you the plate of TV and tell, try to tell me, try to tell the audience what, what this novel is about. Well, you know, I always say the short line for it is uh, sex, violence, and chihuahuas. Love it, love um, it. But, uh, you know, as a southerner, I'm yeah. interested in southern topics and writing about southern towns, and I wanted to write a novel where my recurring character, Will Trent, went undercover because I think it's really interesting when someone has to pretend to be someone else. And so I created this horrible situation in Macon, which has seen its share of horrible situations, so it wasn't hard to find yeah. one that was close to real life, and inserted Will into it and you know came up with an opening I hope grabs people and pulls them into the story and makes them want to know what happens next. I'll never eat pizza the same way in Macon, and I'll never look at a carpenter's claw hammer the same way. Um, can we go back to the very beginning? Uh, I've followed your career. Uh, the first novel I read by you was the, sec your, the second. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was called Kiss Cut, and I just reviewed it last night. And there's Dr. Sarah Linton in the book. Not too many people realize that as a novelist, you can sustain a series as long as you have over a decade with basically the same characters. Was that a, why did you make that choice? Well, I love series novels, and I grew up reading. Uh, well, <laughs> I grew up reading Nancy Drew yeah, yeah. and Encyclopedia Brown, and you know, I think a lot of my readers feel the same way I do when they read my books, yeah. you know, or when I read like a Lee Child or something. Mm. I don't think of it as a Lee Child; I think of it as a Jack Reacher, and that's what pulls me into the story: is what is this character going to do next? And hopefully, people feel that way with Sarah. You know, she's been through a lot. She started off in Grant County and yeah, yeah. had a pretty normal life and then some awful things happened. Um, probably I shouldn't say awful because it's my fault they happened, but she ended up in Atlanta and she met a new guy, Will Trent, and I have been writing about her for a really long time and I hope what people have noticed is that the characters change with each book. Yeah. And that's really what I love most about reading about Harry Bosch, for instance, or sure. any recurring character um, except maybe Kinsey Milhone. I think she stays the same, but I love her anyway. But I like the idea of checking in with a character at different points in their lives and seeing how they've grown or maybe how I've grown is gauged by my reaction to them. Can we talk about one of your principal characters, Will Trent? In fact, the series is named after Will Trent. See if I can see if I have this correctly. Uh, he was born in a horrible situation. Uh, was tortured as a child, basically, cigarettes and scars and all kinds of stuff, dyslexic, becomes an agent in the GBI. How did he become an agent in the GBI? That's, it's not often that a, well, of course, an agency has become a major character in your novels. Talk, well, talk about Will. With Will, you know, in Grant County, yeah. I thought after a while, why is anyone living here? I mean, there are murderers and thieves and rapists and all these horrible people. I mean, it was like Congress. Um, so I wanted to 
have it be more believable that all these bad things would be happening in one city. And so I had to move it to Atlanta. And I didn't want to really be confined to one city. And so the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was a great agency because they're kind of to the state as the FBI is to the country. So they can go into any county as long as they're asked yeah. in. And, you know, so eventually uh, now I'm in Macon, maybe I'll be in Dalton or, you know, send yeah, them yeah. around to different parts of the state. Because um, there's some really fascinating crimes that happen in our state. State. I think being close to Florida has something to do with it. It's funny. Uh, almost three decades ago, I interviewed an author. He was a newspaper man from middle Georgia, and he wrote about the all-day murders. I don't know if you remember them, where a, a gang went into this house, almost like in cold blood. Mm -hmm. And the author told me that, uh, contrary to common sense, you can write about the ha most heinous kinds of crimes in these beautiful, bucolic Georgia counties, like, like, Grant, like Grant County. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but you don't need to be in Detroit or San Francisco or Bangkok to write a, a terrific thriller. That's that's what I'm trying to say, I guess. Well, you know, and I found writing Thanks in Atlanta. Thanks for bailing me out of that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. You know, writing in Atlanta, I'm really conscious that I choose neighborhoods. Oh, you yeah. You know, I don't just say they live in Atlanta. They oh, live yeah. in Virginia Highlands or Buckhead. And or we Amsley. all know yeah, that's yeah, shorthand yeah, yeah. for a different right. person, you know, or Decatur. That tells you what kind of person that is. And even writing in a big city, I'm still kind of writing in small towns. The other side of that, uh, the GBI question was, I interviewed an author several years ago. He wrote Inside Delta Force, and now he's writing thrillers set in Georgia, Eric Haney. And uh, he's always calling on the GBI. And in his, fi his work of fiction, he says, the GBI is still the most honorable, least controversial, least corrupt police force in the state of Georgia. Did you know that before you created this character of Will? Wait a second, I'm getting ahead of, you know the GBI pretty well, don't you? I do, and honestly, it would <laughs> be better shoot, for me if they were corrupt. The, <laughs> <laughs> you've been shooting with these guys. Yeah, and I'll say that our director, Vernon Keenan, you know, he reminds me of every uncle I have who no uh, is, just has that nice twangy kind of accent, but he's one of the smartest guys, I think, that I've ever met. And he really understands crime and criminals, and he knows how to lead people. See, the, I read an interview with him, or maybe a comment, where he reads a lot of thrillers. And he says, uh, Karen can do anything in her book, but if she talks about a bad model of a Glock that fires a parabellum round instead of a 9 million, blah, 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 we'll get on her case. Is that basically That's true? That's true, yeah. And they've been really kind, uh, I, I should say, helpful yeah. uh, pointing things out because gun mistakes will haunt you. I made one in my second book and I still I get letters. I, rec I recall that. Yeah. That's, is, that tr is that troubling for you because you've created an orchestra of characters that resonate in readers' minds. And so do you get emails saying like, uh, 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 wait a second, uh, Lena Adams is, would, never wear, would never wear a red blouse like that. I sometimes <laughs> you know what I'm do. Getting at. Okay. And you know, Grant County was fictional on purpose because sure. there's no Grant County in right, Georgia. Right. And I still got letters from people saying you can't go left on Main Street or you can't get go through drive, drive through Grant County to get to Florida. And I would write back and say, can you show me on the map <laughs> where that's not possible? Um, it did float around a bit. I think my readers are really kind to me uh, in non-gun related uh, issues. Um, you know, I, I have noticed that sometimes my character might be younger in one book than they were in the last book or things like that because I do keep a lot of it in my head. Uh, fortunately, someone who's really into my books went on Wikipedia and wrote all kinds of character stuff oh, yeah. on there. So I can often go to Wikipedia and, and check and see, oh, okay, well, there are 34 in this book, so uh, I need to keep it that I, way. I want to remind the audience, or not remind, but tell the audience that you have a terrific website. Just Google Karen Slaughter and everything is there, videos and plot synopses and the, your bibliography and s stuff like that. I'm going to push my notes away for a minute because um, it's just wonderful having you here. Um, I followed your career, and right now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're one of the top thriller writers, from, let's call them thriller writers, in the world. Um, do you ever pinch yourself and say, I've made it? I mean, um, you know, I'm the youngest of three girls, and okay. so uh, I'm used to a, a shoe always dropping whenever okay. anything good happens. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, 
it would probably be unwise to concentrate on things like sure, that. Sure. What I think about is I'm doing for a living what exactly what I've wanted to do since I was six years old. Absolutely. Literally, my kindergarten teacher would tell you that's what I said yeah. I wanted to do. And so I feel very fortunate about that. And whenever I sit down and I start working on a new book, I think, you know, this is a gift to me. Uh, and the other stuff sort of falls into place then and you know I just can really put it in perspective and say it's uh, sort of um, a bounty in many ways. I'm aware I'm really lucky um, because I know writers who are really good writers who aren't as successful uh, so I just feel like I'm very fortunate to be doing it and try not to think about the other stuff. As I mentioned I read your second novel Kiss Cut, uh, God when it came out what 10, 12 years ago I just finished on seeing your latest novel it's even better you work at your craft, don't you? Absolutely. It's really hard. I mean, I, I'm looking you right in the eye right now because because writing is one of the most difficult things there is, and you you make it seem effortless, effortless, and that's why I know that you're a great writer. Well, thank you. And it it is a lot of work, and I do try to push myself and make new choices in my writing. And you know, in this, for instance, there's a lot of structural things because some of the chapters pay, take place in reverse chronology. It's beautiful, though. Well, you, thank you. Don't, you. You don't know it. You don't yeah, know it. Yeah. Well, so that was something new for me. Seven and days you, before the raid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. So that was a new challenge, and I think it's important to have challenges. I think we all have authors we love, and yeah. we can tell they're getting a little bored with what they're doing. And you know, if there's anyone who's my idol is Stephen King. Uh, I don't know that he's always successful, but he's always trying something different. He writes in every genre. Uh, Neil Gaiman is the same way. You know, he tries to do different things, whether it's writing for Doctor Who or writing for adults or young adults or whatever. He is always pushing himself, and I think that's a laudable thing for a writer to do. Stephen King, I'm a big fan of Stephen King, too. He's now talking about the notion that he will let posterity judge how good he is. You know, he used to care about it a little bit because he was pushed into that genre mm -hmm. of crime thrillers and macabre horror, much like yourself. Um, can we talk about that for a minute? I'm sure. going to ask you the question that you get from every interviewer. I call it the H.P. Lovecraft theory of writing, where if you're going to write about macabre, horrible, unspeakable things in reality, there must be something wrong with the author. I mean, Stephen King kind of shrugged it off, and how do you deal with that? Well, it's interesting you mentioned you, him. You sew people's <laughs> eyes shut. You, yeah. you, you, put, you put things in body well, cavities. I, I write about it. I don't do it. Let's be clear <laughs> I know, about I know, that. I know. Um, but, you know, I've met Stephen King a few times, and yeah. he is probably one of the sweetest, yeah. goofiest guys I've met. Um, you know, Lee Child is the same way. Harlan Coben is hilarious. I mean, he, they're just really laid back. And I think that probably we write our demons out. Um, I, I know that when I write a particularly brutal passage, mm. I always feel some kind of relief. Uh, it's very yeah. cathartic. Um, I would argue, on the other hand, people who write romances or children's books especially, I found can be kind of um, yeah. not so nice people. I'm sure you get that when you're that question from someone in the audience and like, Miss Slaughter, how can you write about that stuff? And I've heard you respond in some interviews, it's fiction. Yeah, and people don't get it, do, do they? Or, well, you know, yeah. and I think that they, when you see an actor yeah. on television, you think that actor is like that character. Oh, yeah. And people do the same thing with authors, but I do that too. When I met Stephen King, I thought he was going to be really spooky and scary, and right, you know, right. I play, think play he appreciates food, that yeah. in a little way, though. Um, so I, I just think that people just make assumptions. And I've got to ask you this, a typical question that you get from everybody. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, as a reader, as a librarian, You've made it to the top shelf. I mean, you are you are on the level of Patricia Highsmith, Lee Child, uh, Michael Conley, Kathy Reichs. You're there. Stephen King, you're there. And yet you still stay in this godforsaken state of Georgia. No, I, I, I love Georgia, but you could... The question, I'll, I'll frame it like this. You can live anywhere you want. You can go anywhere you want, do anything you want, and yet you stay here. How come? I love it. I, lo I love it. What a great answer. I do. I'm really, I'm proud to be from the South. I'm proud specifically to be from Atlanta because it's such an, an integrated and cosmopolitan city. I'm often shocked when I go to New York or Los Angeles at how segregated it is. And so I just, I love being in a place where people are genuinely friendly. 
Okay. And when they ask you, how are you doing, they really mean, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, not like in, in uh, Los Angeles where it's just, well, here's an excuse for yeah. me to talk about myself. Um, I just, I love all of it. And I think that, you know, the culture of the South, we're so nosy and so in everybody's business and so uh, really angry if somebody gets in ours. It really goes into storytelling. Um, and you're a child of the South. Absolutely, yeah. and I grew up with that oral tradition. You know, I remember going to church with my grandmother and she would introduce me to all her friends and as soon as they turned her back, they would she would say something horrible about them, like, well, you know, she drinks. Or, you know, her I husband's cheating on her. Or, I so that. I grew up with this sense that everybody has a secret and I love the South for that. So was, is your father really the second cousin of Ina Slaughter, the great uh, Baseball Hall of Famer? He absolutely I love that. is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Um, we're going to go back to the book right now, and Macon will never be the same. But see if I have this correctly. Uh, there's something rotten in the city of Macon in your book. There's drug trafficking. There's someone, an unknown guy named, we can call him Big Whitey, who seems to be killing cops, killing anybody who stands in his way. Uh, the GBI is called in, some pe some cops are almost killed, cops are being killed in Macon. Um, have you had any backlash from the people of Macon? Um, not yet. I actually okay. had some people saying, yeah, oh, we're so happy that you wrote about us. Um, I think most of my readers tend to be the bloodthirsty kind, so okay, okay. They, want, they want to read about horrible things. There's, um, there's, one, there's one scene in, in Unseen that I love where, like, a really bad guy. He's got tattoos on him, he's got uh, long hair on the sides and short hair on the top and aviator glasses and like chains and everything like that. And you remark that in Macon, you don't know if someone who looks like that is either good or bad, but that's, but you, that's true of Atlanta or anywhere in the South. Yeah. I like the way you, 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 you juxtapose things like that. But I think you like, can I ask you to read just one small passage, from Absolutely. page 93. And uh, I'll be talking while I find this, but I like the way you talk about Grady Hospital, which is also a character in your book. And this is Dr. Sarah Linton. As one character said, she's a medical examiner and a pediatrician. So she sees people coming in the world and seeing people going out of the world. Now she's in Macon General Hospital. She's come down from Atlanta where she works sometimes at Grady Hospital and just Right there, she pre Sarah pressed the button and and mm -hmm. with that right there, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Karen Slaughter reading from her latest novel, Unseen. Sarah pressed the button beside the elevator door. It was hard to believe that just a few hours ago she'd done the same in Atlanta. As with the exterior of the hospital, Grady's interior was different compared to Macon General. Everything here was clean and modern, befitting the clientele. Most of the hospital's money probably came from luxurious birthing suites, routine colonoscopies, and MRIs on baby boomers' knees. The paint was not chipped from the walls. Buckets were not strategically placed under leaking pipes. There was no permanent police precinct on site or a holding area for prison inmates in the criminally insane. Frankly, Sarah preferred Grady. I love that. I love that. Um, you branched out over the years, and I'm very curious about how you, as a best-selling author, is dealing with the phenomenon of ebooks and Kindles and stuff like that. Oddly enough, I was in the hospital a couple of years ago for a, just a minor, minor uh, procedure, and I read um, Thorn in My Side, which I loved on the Kindle. And right now you have Unremarkable Heart, which is available on as an ebook. It's a short story. It blew me away. It's so good. It won an Edgar Award. It won the, the I said, am I saying it right, Macaf? McCavity. McCavity Award. The Edgar Award is the Mystery Writers of America, and the McCavity is the Mystery Writers International. I mean, bravo, bravo. Um, how do you, I'm, I'm, thro I'm throwing you a softball right now, excuse me, but I know you're going to stay a novelist, but are you experimenting with the e-books and stuff like that? Is that something your agent wants you to do, or is that something that you're doing by yourself? Well, it's something I've always done, um, and I love writing short stories. I think that it's really important for me as a novelist to work on characters and different things in short stories. And, I mean, let's be honest, there's really not a place until we had the Kindle and the Nook and all yeah, these devices yeah. for short stories to be published. And during the Faulkner's Day or Flannery O'Connor or Fitzgerald, there were magazines that published short stories all the time. There was a real 
a medium for it, and there was a, min a big demand in the public for it, and that tapered off, as all things do, and I think that with Kindle and Nook and all these devices, yeah. iPad, that people are finally rediscovering short stories, because they're great. I mean, they're really, it, it's, Flannery O'Connor, basically, if I can paraphrase, sure, sure. you know, she said it's not the short, it's the story. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And I think if a, someone is really concentrating on writing a good short story, that they can do miraculous things. Um, it's just a, a way, I think, especially if you're a novelist, to try to spread your wings in other genres. Um, sometimes you fail, sometimes you do well. Um, and it, for me, it, I can be really dark in a short story or very lighthearted and I can get away with you it because it's me, only Karen, a few no. pages. Um, you know, that, and that would be hard to sustain in a book. Um, but I love the idea that people are more invested in short stories now. I get a little upset when they complain about the price because, you know, a dollar ninety nine for something that takes me six months to write seems like a good bargain. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, people buy um, greeting cards and those only have six words on them, and they don't complain about, oh, I had to pay two dollars for. Yeah, and the thorn in my side is still on my Kindle, and I can hand it to a friend and stuff like that. Um, get back to the short story because I think, as a, as a librarian, I, I see more and more people reading short stories. For the, are you feeling that way too? I mean, the last decade or so, people. Short stories have come back, collections and stuff. I think so, yeah. And you know, you saw Annie Prue with her oh, fantastic love, yeah, collections. Yeah. Um, Accordion Crimes, I think, is one of the best American short story collections I've ever read. Or All of Kitteridge, I thought was fantastic with Link stories. Um, but I love The Red Pony. You know, I love yeah. Link stories. Um, and you know, I think there is really a medium for them if publishers present them uh, in a in a good light. Um, a lot of times when you say to your publisher, I'd like to do a short story, the collection, they think, oh, crap, you know, um, we're not going to sell a million copies of this. Um, and so they're a little reluctant. But with the digital format, they're all in for it because it's no production cost, you know. They can just do the file and people can download it and share it and libraries can have it and that sort of thing. And I think it's great. And people who have reading devices like a Kobo or an oh, iPad yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. they buy more books. So that's good for all of us. Well, I, I knocked off The Unremarkable Heart in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and it's about a 20-page sh short story. It's, it's wonderful, but all I could think about, and I'm going to date myself, was I expected Rod Serling to walk out <laughs> from behind the curtain of my house last night and say, <clears throat> you are now entering the Twilight Zone, or Tales from the Dark Side, or something like that. Let me segue into that. What's your feeling about, you have not been adapted yet into TV or film. But no. I'm, you, but I'm sure you've got the, what the, what do they call the, the options? Yeah, and you know, and I haven't wanted to be. Um, for many years, they never wanted the author to be involved, and I would have people say, well, what if we put it in South London? Or what if we, yeah. you know, change the location? Or what if we made this character the, you know? Yeah. And I just wasn't interested in that, because I feel a real loyalty to my readers and to the work I've created to make sure it's as close as it can be. And so I'm working with a production company now who really wants the author to be involved. Uh, and I think we have people like Charlene Harris and Kathy Reichs to thank yeah, for that. Yeah. And, and even Stephen King is very heavily involved in Under the Dome. So, yeah. you know, there's been a trend toward Hollywood people saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe the writer knows more about this character than we do, and maybe the fact that they've sold so many books to so many people means they understand the audience a little better. So they've let writers be more involved, um, writers of the source material be more involved, which I think is fantastic. Now I'm going to conclude this interview by quoting a friend of mine, I don't want to mention her name, Candace Dyer, good, good, good writer, but um, I asked Candace about, you know, what are your impressions of uh, Karen Slaughter? And, uh, and Candace said, well, kind of ask her about Mike Thevis. Now, I'm old enough to remember Mike Thevis. Are, are you planning something about Atlanta in the 70s? Because this was a king of pornography. I mean, living here in Atlanta. I mean, it's, it sounds like a slaughter novel to me. Absolutely. Oh, come, really? Yeah. <laughs> My next novel, Cop Town, takes oh, no. place oh, in no. the 70s. And we'll see a little of Mike Thevis. He's actually in prison in North Carolina. He's yeah. very old. He's never really given interviews. Um, and I'm going to reach out to him and see if he'll talk to me. I think he will. Just send, just send him a couple of these novels. He'll say, oh, I, 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 I haven't just done that. I've, I've read it. I've, I've lived this. Um, I'm going to conclude with my, my very last question. I just want to know one more time. You really love living in Atlanta. You can go anywhere in the world. Absolutely. This and is my place. you but you are going to leave Earth. That's a rumor I've heard. Yes. Talk about that for one second. 
Uh, well, She's leaving Earth, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Well, I'd really love to see suborbital space, um, but I promised my father that I won't do it until 100 people have done it on the uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, that's unbelievable. Yeah, and I was ready to go uh, before the financial fallout, and because of that, they stopped um, promoting it as much, and I think they had some setbacks, and there was a small explosion that I haven't told my father about, but uh, eventually I'd love to do it. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been talking to Karen Slaughter. Her latest novel is called Unseen. She's one of my favorite writers. Read her novels, her short stories, get a Kindle, download her work. Uh, it's just remarkable, wonderful meeting you. Karen, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. That just went by like a charm. Unbelievable. <laughs> Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed.